In today's show, we talk about what accounts about medieval saints tell us about disabled individuals. Welcome to the Medieval Grad Podcast. It's a podcast brought to you by Medievalist.net, where we meet and chat with graduate students and early career researchers from all over the world to learn about the new trends and the future of research in medieval studies. I'm Lucie Lemonnier, a medieval historian and your host, and today I'm talking with Adelheid Rosenberger, a PhD candidate at Queen Mary University of London, England, under the supervision of Dr. Mary Robin. Heidi, hi, thank you very much for being here today. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. I, I, I like to take the opportunity to talk about my work partly because it helps me think through it. It's something about talking about what you're studying to someone else means you actually have to really clarify what you're saying. Um, Heidi, would you introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your background? Well, I've always studied history. My bachelor's was in history at the University of Cambridge, but there I wasn't specializing specifically in medieval history. It wasn't until I came to um, choose where I wanted to go for my master's that I decided that I really wanted to look at medieval history in particular. Although having said that, when I was studying for as an undergraduate was when my interest in medieval history and particularly the medieval body and understandings of the body really came through. I remember I was reading about um, medieval heresy and particularly the Qatars. And I don't, I mean, I know that as a historian, it's very bad to sort of posthumously diagnose different groups of people, but this academic or that this author was looking at the idea that the Qatars were almost like a form of early anorexia. Um, so I have a personal experience of anorexia, so I could really relate to that. But what really struck me was this idea that people's bodies influence how they see themselves and how others see them. Um, so that was kind of where my interest, particularly in medieval medieval bodies, I suppose, came. I did my master's at the University of York, which was very enjoyable but I didn't actually focus that much on the body but when it came back to doing my PhD and trying to find a topic that would help me explore that interest in the body and the way that people's identities are so integral to their physical selves it's not like sort of you have your mind you have your body and they don't meet so when I got to that I was like I was looking around trying to find something um, that would enable me to explore that um, but eventually came across disability and I'd been reading other works looking at things like childhood or looking at um, different ideas of gender and the body in, in canonization inquests and how these were revealed through the study of the, the miracles that were recorded in them. But I realized that no one had really looked at the disabled body in this context, which in some ways struck me as being really odd because you have these miracles which are talking about bodies that are broken or damaged or not seen as whole in some way and they're being cured and healed and made whole or made better, even if it's not completely whole. And no one has used this as a way of exploring the body. Um, so when I was looking for a supervisor, Mary Rubin had done a considerable amount of work on ideas of religion and spirituality. And also she's just really encouraging and helped point me in the right direction. So I was really pleased to be able to work, work under her at Queen Mary's. And so your dissertation looks at the medieval disabled body, drawing on evidence from 14th century canonization inquisitions. Could you explain to us what are the sources, these canonization inquests or inquisitions? Okay. I always say that canonization inquests are a bit like court cases, except rather than trying to prove whether someone is innocent or guilty, you're trying to prove whether this person who has now died wasn't simply another person, but actually was so good and holy that they have become a saint. So the papacy from the 13th century or across the 13th century starts to look to gain increased control or oversight over the process of canonization and who is declared to be a saint rather than local communities deciding that their local holy person must have been a saint. So they send out commissioners and notaries and lawyers and other people from the from the curia to different locations where miracles attributed to the saint have been recorded and also to where the saint had lived. And they ask lots of questions. They have witnesses who will come in and they'll ask some questions about the life and morality of this person. 
So they established that this person was definitely good. And then they will also ask questions to people who claim to have made some form of prayer or devotion to the saint or purported saint at this point. Maybe they went on a pilgrimage to their tomb or they vowed that if such and such happened, they would bring some wax or regularly remember them. And then something miraculous happened as a result of that. Someone was resurrected from the dead. Quite a lot of miracles involving children were that someone had fallen into a well. They thought they were died. They prayed to a saint and the child comes back to life. Or it might be miracle healings, which is what I'm looking at. Um, although you do get some really odd ones, which are sort of the healing of a horse who was blind. Um, some of them are sort of a, a bit a bit bizarre. I think there was several in the St. Thomas de Cantaloupe's um, canonization inquest about a favourite hawk or falcon that had belonged to someone who had died and the falcon got resurrected. So basically this creates a whole dossier of not quite word for word, but it's meant to be as close a written account of what this witness has said which from my point of view is really useful because aside from the fact that this is a scribe transcribing what this person has said into Latin and putting it into the third person, it's about as close to a witness statement as we can get from this period. In your dissertation, uh, you investigate that particular experience of being a disabled person in the Middle Ages. Uh, you look at the individual's connections to and perception of their own body and of the bodies of others. So I'm wondering how you analyze your sources and what they are telling you about that particular experience of being a disabled person. Well, I've gone through the th my three main sources, or I'm in the process of going through them. Um, that's the canonization inquests of St. Thomas de Cantaloupe, who was the Bishop of Hereford. The canonization inquests of St. Louis of Toulouse, so that's southern France and Provence. And the canonization of St. Nicholas of Tolentino, which is in Italy. And I've been going through them and trying to identify the miracles that are about someone being healed from a physical disability. There's a degree to which I'm deciding which things are physical disabilities and which aren't, because there isn't a really clear definition of what is disability for a medieval person. So I'm taking it as a condition which is likely to be incurable or very difficult to cure and is also likely to last a long time if nothing is done. So I've been looking through the way that the person who experienced that disability, whether they were blind or deaf or um, had a mobility problem, and how they recounted that being disabled, the words that they use, and sometimes the quality or value that appears to be added to that. So for example, it's very common for people to describe being overcome or overtaken by blindness or by an illness that affects them. There's a sense of almost being attacked or uh, as if the disability is an external force that overcomes them rather than being something that is integral to them. And then I, I look at how their description of that might change as they become cured and the words they use to describe being cured. It's really common across all three sources to hear phrases like they were cured and liberated or cured and freed from that. And I find it really interesting that there's that qualitative aspect. It's not just that you were made better but there was a, a freedom or a, a sort of restoration of self. Similarly, even if someone has had a congenital disability, they might have been blind from birth or whatever, there's still sometimes they use words like restoring of sight or re-giving of sight, as if the blindness was something that was added to them that wasn't originally there or shouldn't have been there, and they were going back to an uh, earlier state. And then while I'm doing that, I also look at the way that people describe their sort of day-to-day -day experiences, the way that other people treated them, whether they were able to go to work or whether they're being sailed to prevent them from doing that, how they might have got to the shrine, how other people may have cared for them or enabled them to get to a shrine, what may have prompted them to, to ask to devote themselves to a particular saint and ask for a miracle. And I think that's important because it explains or gives an insight into how social relationships may or may not have changed as a re result of someone being disabled. You get those networks of care that people have, or it becomes a sort of a useful counterpoint to their descriptions of being disabled. They might feel like they are powerless, abandoned, not able to work or sort of being right at the bottom of social sort of hierarchy, which was obviously very real to them. 
But on the other hand, you can sometimes tell you that they are still part of a society with people coming in and caring for them and helping them get to a shrine and so on. That can also be very useful because it helps me to look at how the perception of someone's disability changes depending on whether they are the disabled person themselves or whether they are a witness looking at the dis disabled person. And that in some ways is the most interesting bit. There's one case that I find really interesting, which is the case of a girl called Rosenda who lived in the area around Provence. And when she was born or at a very early age, um, she had a hit some form of hearing impediment. And the way that she describes it is very different from the way her parents and her brothers describe it. So for her, she constantly says things like, I heard that I was deaf or I was told that I was deaf. And as I grew up, I could, there was more buzzing in my ears and people told me that I was deaf. And by contrast, her brothers and her parents are always very so strong in the fact that, yes, she, she, she was deaf. She couldn't hear. She couldn't hear. So it's like, well, Rosenda says, it's other people who are telling me that I'm deaf. And the quality or the words and the emotions that they convey are also very different. Rosenda herself doesn't seem especially bothered by the fact that she's deaf. And when her father um, vows to St. Louis that he will take her to um, his tomb if, if he cures his daughter from the deafness, she rejoices, but she doesn't rejoice because she's been healed. She rejoices because she's been vowed to someone. That does actually come across quite a few times where people sort of rejoice, not because they are healed, but because they were vowed to someone, as if that connection is what's important rather than the changes in their body. And by contrast with Rosenda being not necessarily overly concerned about her deafness, it probably was something that bothered her, but it doesn't seem to be like the main factor of her life. Her parents and her brothers are sort of expressing how this is so painful and sorrowful that she was deaf and one of them says oh it would be better if she had been dead rather than being alive you occasionally do hear that where it's sort of like oh and he thought it would be better to be dead than to be like this i think there is a degree of hyperbole in that um and i don't know whether her gender played into that because perhaps being female there would be expectations of marriage and being deaf may have made it harder or, or may have just created in like extra barriers i'm not sure but there's also this irony in it, in that with the case of Rosenda, she only really gets this opportunity to talk to her, for herself and to express herself and say what her experience is because she was cured. She doesn't really take on this identity of being deaf. She always says there's other people who call me deaf. And, but it's because she has or had this disability and then was cured and that other people were very concerned that she should be cured and she needed to be healed she finally gets the opportunity to actually speak for herself and tell the inquisitors, this is what my experience was. So when you look at, at your records, you're looking for instances of disability. But, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think that the issue, uh, the, the challenge is that there is no word in the Middle Ages to designate disability. Mm -hmm. So how did medieval people understand disability? Well, in some ways, that's what I'm trying to find out. When you look at disability studies and particularly the history of or disability history in the Middle Ages, there are a lot of preconceptions that come with it, particularly for earlier historiography. There's this idea that people who are disabled were probably viewed as, you know, maybe they'd sinned and God was punishing them or their parents had sinned. They had sex at the wrong time and therefore they punished them by making their children disabled. Or there'll be this idea that disabled people were automatically outcast and they were just beggars living on the streets and they didn't really have many opportunities or they just don't feature at all in, in, in the historiography. And I think this might partly be because of, as you say, there's no clear word for disability. There's lots of different words that get used like um, impotens, um, debilito, um, infirmus, which all imply sort of a lack of power, um, a reduction of power, not being able to do something. And then there are perhaps words that refer to very specific disabilities, like word for blind or deaf. So that, I guess, because there's, there isn't a very clear category, we can much more easily put our own preconceptions onto it. For example, that disabled people must have automatically been assumed to be disabled due to sin, or that you know, they, they had no hope, they were just living as poor beggars. I think this comes a little bit because of models of disability that we have in contemporary uh, disability studies. So 
in the during the 20th century disability was very often framed in terms of medical problems it was a medical problem that needed curing or it was a medical problem which you couldn't cure but you could find a way of dealing with it so then we have projected that back into the middle ages with the idea that it's a medical problem they need to explain it so either you took the religious idea of they were sinners that's why they're, they're like this or you took the medical model which was well no one could actually cure them so they probably couldn't do anything with beggars but from the work that I'm doing and from what I can see from the canonization inquests and also what more recent scholarship on disability in, in, in the Middle Ages is really bringing out, that there are so many different experiences of disability. And it's not the case that if you are disabled, you are automatically shunned or that everyone assumed you must have sinned or that you would have necessarily been poor. There are so many other things that influence that, whether that's your gender, where you live, your occupation where you are on the economic scale to begin with. If you're wealthy and you're disabled, it's probably less a problem than if you were an artisan or someone living in a very rural area where your ability to have a, the complete physical use of your body was perhaps more important. Yeah, and I feel what you're saying really resonates with the work of Mark O'Toole, who yeah. investigated the, the hospital of the Quinze Vins in Paris, which was a hospital dedicated to a visually impaired individual and uh, blind people. And he found that most of them actually had their job. Yeah. So they were really part of society. Yeah, And it also resonates with... Um, a paper I recently gave at a small French conference on disability, and I found uh, several instances of uh, disabled individuals in fiscal sources. But the striking thing was that disability was only mentioned in the case of poor people or impoverished individuals, and their disability really served to explain, justify, and excuse their poverty. And no wealthy taxpayer was described as being, I don't know, blind or deaf or, you know, disabled. It's as if their disability was not relevant because it did not impact their wealth. Yeah, it's almost like it wasn't relevant. Um, you see a similar thing in Sharon Farmer's work on poverty in Paris. So although she is looking at people who were poor and were disabled, you can see how the poverty ch is changed by the fact they are disabled or the way that, for example, their gender influences how they're perceived as both someone who is poor and disabled. In some ways, the worst position to be in terms of the social perception on you would be to be young, male and disabled because being young and being male implies that you should be able to work. And then if you're disabled, it's kind of like denying those things that you would usually associate with your age and with your gender. You mentioned earlier that uh, contrary to some preconceived ideas, um, disabled people were not necessarily marginalized or outcasts in medieval society. Um, could you elaborate a little bit on that? I think it's really important to remember that these people were members of families or usually members of families unless they were orphaned or had some other condition, you know, some other circumstance that meant that they were pulled out of their family. Um, so they can be a member of a family, members of a community, some of them are monks, nuns, friars, they have people around them and people who care for them. Not just in an emotional sense, but when they become disabled, these people will look after them and they do look after them. We see this very clearly in a lot of the sources. Even sometimes when it's um, the, the person who benefits from the miracle is a beggar, we know about them because other witnesses had cared for them or were concerned about them and then attest to them. If, on their behalf in front of the papal um, inquisitors. They might be included in society simply because although they could be blind or deaf or have some form of mobility impairment, that doesn't actually stop them from working or stop them from raising children, looking after their, their older parents or whatever it is. They still interact with and function as a person and they are in society on that basis. They are not sort of hopeless and rejected simply because they can't see they may need to make um, some form of um, adjustment for them. But, you know, the fact that someone has a disability is no reason to not allow them to become a fully functioning member of society if that's possible. I mean, I will put the sort of caveat on this that because of the sources I'm using are people who are healed, they're people who are more likely to have had some sort of minor interaction. Um, 
if it had been a, a beggar who had very few interactions with other people and was never healed or never experienced some form of partial partial healing, they're not going to appear in these in these inquests. Um, but I think it is really important to remember that disabled people in the Middle Ages, as now, aren't just the disabled. Disabled people all have relationships with other people. They have people who care for them. The people who care for them are affected by their disability. And also they are so much more than that. And they be can become members of society. And we can see this through some of these inquests. Thank you for this very, very nice conclusion. Thank you. Um, um, before we say goodbye, uh, I'd like to ask a question to uh, the people who come to the podcast. And that question is, um, if you had to give any piece of advice to a prospective graduate student or a recently enrolled graduate student, um, what would that be? Oh, gosh. Um, first, get a good supervisor. Yeah. If you have a supervisor who supports you, it makes everything so much easier. Second, It's really trite to say that everyone thinks that they are an imposter, but it's absolutely true. And we are researchers, so we're learning and we're asking questions. We don't have the answers. You know, the whole point of being a researcher is to ask questions, not to have answers. And then the third one would be, be disciplined in your organization and your timekeeping. Set aside times when you're going to work, but set aside times when you won't work. And that's just as important because your PhD can't be your life. You know, you have to have other things outside of that. You can't study 24-7. I'm not saying that I should do any of those things, but those are sort of the advice that I would give to someone else. Thank you so much, Heidi. It was really lovely having you here and talking to you about your fascinating research. Thank you for inviting me. That was Adelheid Rosenberger, a PhD candidate at Queen Mary University of London, England. Her info are in the show notes. Stay with us, because the episode isn't over yet. It's time for the second segment of the Medieval Grad Podcast, where I talk with Peter Konechny from Medievalist.net. Hi, Peter. How are you doing? What did you think of the interview? Oh, you know, it's it's a very, uh, very kind of interesting. Uh, I think uh, disability studies has really become very popular. In, I'd say like five, last five, ten years. Uh, and you know, there's, you know, for various reasons, people have be, become... Uh, want to learn more about how they were kind of people with disabilities were kind of depicted in the past, what how they were treated, uh, and with the, their own roles in society. So yeah, it's it's great that she's been able to uh, access all these kind of uh, resources. So so yeah, I was yeah I, I was I was quite like it. Your thoughts? Well, um, I really I was really interested in the story about the deaf girl because. What I, what struck me is that the the girl really didn't see herself as being disabled, and the miracle she was not necessarily wanting to be cured with quotes, but all the discourses about disabilities, especially in saints' life, first are written well to justify the saints' sainthood and sanctity, but also they are written I think from um, an able perspective. And in many cases, um, able people have kind of a discourse about disability when we see it as a handicap, while the perspective of the disabled individual is not necessarily the same. So what I really liked about Heidi's work is the emphasis she puts on the, the individual's own experiences. So she tries to carry their voices and understand how they saw themselves. And I, I really think that's very cutting edge and interesting. Yeah, yeah, you don't you don't see very much with the, the source where people are talking about their own experiences. So, you know, I, she pointed out uh, like some of the records, like their, your disability was only remarked on if you were poor, right? Uh, so, like there was like no uh, wealthy people or well-off people that with disabilities. But so I thought that was quite interesting and and things like that. But yeah, she she seemed to be going with uh, a lot of kind of a good work on that. So yeah. One more thing I want to say with the canonization inquests is I've been reading a book called uh, Souls Under Siege, uh, Stories of War, Plague, and Confession in 14th Century Provence. It's by Nicole Archambault. Uh, it just came out, uh, and she's looking at the canonization inquest of this uh, 14th century countess uh, from Provence, right? And 
she's been able to kind of find all these kind of different perspectives and views as she's trying to draw out the stories uh, about the people that told this canonization, I guess, or were like part of it, the inquest, right? So it's, I kind of find it, it's a, again, it's a really kind of fascinating area of history to look into. Yeah, definitely. What, one more thing I, I should point out is if you're really interested in medieval disability studies, uh, the place, best place to start with is the medieval disability source book. Oh, yeah, yes. And it's very recent, right? Yeah. I think um, 2020, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it's, I think it's kind of ongoing. It's it's from Punctum Books. They have made it uh, open access. So anyone, if you want, you can go in and, and download a copy. Uh, and yeah, there's a lot of kind of research in, in that field. So yeah, like, uh, so I think yeah, she's going to be on the cutting edge of that work. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Peter. It was a lot of fun. Thanks. <laughs> That was the Medieval Grad Podcast brought to you by Medievalists.net. If you want to support us and support this podcast, you can subscribe to our Patreon, patreon.com slash medievalists. You can get a lot of neat benefits on Patreon, including being able to hear these episodes early. We really love doing this show and we'd really appreciate your help. I'm Lucie Lemonnier. You can find me on Instagram. My handle is at the French Medievalist. You can also look me up on academia.edu. Thank you very much for tuning in. Bye bye. Au revoir.